as usual, I'm forgetting everything at the mo at the right moment. But I hope that now, now it says at my end that is is uh, is running. So I'm thinking that is okay. So with that, uh, please keep in mind that while I'm doing the presentation, I cannot see neither the chat or the people or anything in the screen beyond my presentation. So I will start sharing my screen and we will start now with the first session of the presentation. OK, so let's see if I can find my presentation. Everybody can see my screen. Yes. And now move it to the. Yes. OK, sounds good. Thank you very much. So the first session, uh, today's session is split in three parts of the presentation. So the first session will be about the introduction about the census. OK, so. Uh, we will try to cover as much as we can with the detail that we think is important for you and consider this couple of presentation as an invitation for you to try by yourself. This is a course that is designed at the introductory level, the most basic level. And my best recommendation at this moment is that no matter how much or how little did, do you will you learn today, you won't be as effective as you want or as you need if you don't try by yourself. Don't feel free to make mistakes. This is your workshop. This is your course. So if making mistakes makes you feel more comfortable, don't hesitate because this is the way that you will have a better um, enhanced uh, learning experience and chances are that you will learn more. You will have more benefits by trying that. In fact, it is already calculated that around 20% of our tries in everything in life will be mistakes. And that 20% is usually more common or more frequent at the beginning of any new activity that we are engaged, okay? So don't feel uh, afraid, don't feel disappointed, don't feel uh, uh, intimidated by the amplitude by the extents of the topic. Just feel encouraged, feel uh, uh, supported, feel a, a little bit ambitious and wild and try whatever we will be talking in the next two sessions by yourself later on and try to find your own path in the data. The proverbial the proverbial uh, example that we need to, to learn, uh, we need to teach a person to learn to avoid uh, instead of giving the, the fish to, to avoid him or her to be hungry, doesn't apply here because here the well of the data that you will have access to is so large that you don't need to know how to fish. You just need to know to be willing to put your hands, to put your arms in the water to take the fishes that are there in available for you in terms of uh, information in terms of data that hopefully will help you to understand better what is the main to 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 rescue from or data. So also the main the main objective will be to cover most of the common basic options regarding working with the 2021 census is still we are expecting that you leave these sessions feeling a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more ambitious in explore data in general, and specifically data from our website. Data from Statistics Canada is data that is has a very, very high quality. So in other words, we want you to be first very curious with the data and second to be very wise when you are using or when you are consuming data, because data is the raw material for factual information that helps you to make a strong statements, to support your story, your statements in such a way that you can be sure that what you are presenting, what you are communicating is really reflecting what is happening with the population with the phenomena, with the society that you are intending 
to describe, okay? So these are the topics that we will be covering in the first part. We will talk about the uh, the census in general, the 2021 census more in specific, uh, the most basic about the methodology, how census data are used. We will show some examples that hopefully will enlighten the ones that of, the, of you that are not very familiar, for the ones that are familiar, that has some experience that you were being uh, uh, talking in the presentation. It will be a little bit trivial this part, but it still hopefully will help you to understand better how to use it. Let me tell you, the census is the most comprehensive and the most extensive and complete uh, survey that we have in Statistics Canada that give us a very nice portrait of the Canadian society uh, at the moment that the, the data is uh, is collected, but it still is not complete. OK, so that will tell you, but that will pull you in a way that other parts of the portrait, the portrait or the parts of the picture that is the Canadian society that are not there, hopefully by understanding the census data will help you to make the others missing part a little bit easier for you to understand or to collect the data or to put it in the right scope for the possibilities that other data that are linked to your uh, uh, experience will be more available or more relevant. So that's who we are. I don't want to uh, I spend a lot of time here talking to you about all the possibilities with your data, but it's very, very, very important uh, basically to uh, underline that most of the data that we have available in our website, or basically all the data that we have available in our website is free and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have 467 active surveys, more than 450 surveys in the field, and around 384 that were already terminated, that were already discontinued, but still whose information, which information is still available, is still uh, uh, possible to consult in most of the cases, and hopefully, can help you to understand what to do or how to access that information. I don't want to, to jinx my presentation by clicking in this link, but this link we will be talking about that later on. And I will show you how you can access all that information that is there. Because as I tell you, census is the main objective of this presentation. Census is the main survey that we do in Statistics Canada, but it's not all. There's a wealth of information I know that you will find a lot of value in other surveys that are there, and the way that you can relate it to the census will be very helpful in your own uh, line of, of work to try to make it a little bit more meaningful and complete the picture that you are presenting from the issue that you are dealing with. Okay, so. The census, as we already mentioned, and you will be hearing that come, uh, uh, over and over and over again, is, is the main focus of this presentation, of course, and is the main survey that we do in Statistics Canada. And one of our goals in this presentation will be to make you feel that the census is the open sesame or the, the key experience that will help you to have a better use of the data that is available in our website. So we produce data in many, many, many forms, information in many, many forms, depending on the scale that you are looking for. And most of the common one or the one that is more consulted and consumed is in the form of tabulations. But we have almost 11,000 different tables, and that number is growing constantly. Every day that there is a new data release, chances are that we are incorporating, we are updating, we are uh, uh, design new tabulations that will be available for you. Of those almost 11,000 tables that we have, around 3,000, 2,900, a little bit more than 2,900 are census data and more than 440 of those tabulations are from the 20, 20, 2021 uh, uh, census. So you can see that sometimes it's a little bit intimidating try to look at our data, try to look at our website. Our website, 
uh, uh, contains a little bit more than three and a half million pages. So a lot of people came to us and say, well, it's so overwhelming. It's so frustrating sometimes trying to find uh, information. And the reason why is because if you are not familiar with the web story that we try to keep track of the data, you can get lost in many, many, many ways. So that's the reason why you will see we will try to put uh, in, in the in this presentation, we will try to make an effort to guide you into uh, uh, getting some of the resources that we have available in our website. So the first thing that we want to 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 show you regarding the census are the release dates. And in our opinion, this is important, and that's the reason why we keep this this uh, slides here because the first version that we did is still some of uh, those days weren't still in the calendar yet, so they were kind of uh, in the future, but now they are in the past and then you can figure it out. Well, why are they putting why are they putting these these dates if they are in the past? But we did it on purpose because one of the key issues that you can have or, or you can take advantage of this uh, 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 information is that uh, when you are using or when you are using our website, if you go to the daily, the daily is or daily information uh, uh, media that we release for all the data that we are uh, releasing in a daily basis. OK, so the daily is the name. If you go to the daily on those dates, you will find very nice, very simple, very complete articles with the highlights for all those topics that are there. So you go to the daily version of February 9, 2022, you will find the article about population and dwelling counts, and they, that uh, uh, article will guide you, will be, uh, you can invest maybe 10 or 12 minutes, but will enlighten you with the most uh, uh, outstanding the most updated information came from the census regarding population and dwelling counts. And that will help you to understand better and to have a better idea what are the topics that will be more relevant, what are the issues that you have to be more uh, uh, aware on, on those topics, and how can you make a better use of that data of that information. This is very, very important because in that way, then you can use some analogies, you can use some examples, you can use some references to make your experience working with the data a little bit easier, a little bit better, and with more effective results. So the census is one, one uh, uh, very important survey but it's something that is has been changing through the times. And this is exactly the, the big trade-off, the big uh, dilemma with the census. In the census, because it's a historical uh, uh, account, it's something that has been very systematically done for many, many, many years, basically comes back to, as you can see, uh, uh, almost uh, 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 400 years ago, 350 years ago, with the first census in 1666, and we want to keep constant or consistent all the information that came in the census in order to be able to compare and have a better historical track of the issues that are important, that are relevant for our society. But at the same time, and this is the, the contradiction, the dichotomy in the census, at the same time, we want to be sure that the census is relevant, that the information that we're including or that is pertinent to the census is still reflecting what is happening in the society at the time that we are taking the information and with some projection into the future. So you can see this is one of the millstones in the census, a very, very brief story. If we talk about more in detail the story of the census, we can spend here several weeks, if not months, talking just about that. But this will show you how census has been evolving, evolving in terms of their methodology, in terms of the coverage, in terms of the issues that has marked or has put 
a, a huge uh, uh, um, mark in the development of the census and how the population has been changing, has been growing through all those years. So you can see the new, the, the first census in New, new France count for a little bit more than 3,200 people, and then less less than a little bit more than 200 years ago, that amount multiplies time a thousand. So we were counting for more than three um 3.4 million people. Nowadays, the last census was almost 37 million people, and you can see how there have been all these changes in the methodologies, in the context, in the issues that were relevant for the census. Okay, so uh, as any survey in the census, and the census is of course not deception, in the hair of any survey, in the heart, the core of any survey, we want to have a very competitive uh, response rate. And this is very important because that way we want to be sure that we are covering all the population that is targeted all the population that we need the information from. The census, we are very, very lucky because the census has a very high response rate, not the 100% that we wish, but it's still very, very high, as you can see, for all the parameters that has in the national level at, at the provincial level. This is very, very important here in Canada. We are very, very lucky because many people understand that responding survey from Statistics Canada, responding to the census is one of the easiest, cheapest way to help to the community to have a good, a, a, a healthy information system that hopefully will help us to make better decisions. This is the key of the use of the data census that we can have information that is reliable that is accurate that that is updated that will help us to have better decisions tools for the use of the resources so the census has some unique characteristics that make it so so important okay so as you can imagine being the most extensive in terms of population coverage the census becomes the benchmark that can be used to plan and do not only the census per se, but other surveys and the comparison for other publications, other sources of information that are there. The main issue that arises with the census, the one that is really, really easy to understand and to justify the collection and the existence of the data and the use of all the resources to collect the data is that the census is the key source for small geographies area data in terms that sometimes will be the only source of data that is available for very, very small areas in terms of the geographic uh, uh, extension and also is the source for a specific uh, populations, a specific target populations that could be minorities, that could be not very extensive, that could be vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera. So those two facts justify or make it more outstanding the role that the census plays when we are using, when we are collecting the data, when we are using the data, when we are making the interpretation of the information that can. So this is very, very important because basically they are the only ones that are there. And not only that, the fact that our census in Canada is King Kenyan, that means that is every five years make it very, very, very unique. There's only a few countries in the world that can afford to have a King Kenyan census. Canada is one of them. The other two that are more common are Australia and uh, New Zealand, and nowadays Japan and Ireland are also considering very, very seriously, I don't know if they have already done, but they are considering, they were considering very seriously to start some quinquennial censuses because that way, excuse me, they could keep a better track of all the changes in society and make better use of the resources available. And as I mentioned before, the census is always, always updating. 
it's always trying to be to keep the relevance of the information that we are collecting there and some changes take place. Like, for example, the 2021 was one of the census that has more additions and more new items because we were um, mentioning, we were adding all this new information that weren't before in the way that we needed or the way that we will expect it to have it. So we are the one of the, the ones that uh, uh, make more or were more expected in many, many uh, places in society was the inclusion of gender information. So in the previous censuses, we were collecting all information only about sex in terms of males or females, the dichotomy that is traditional for most of this data, but now we also collect information about gender. We will be talking about that later on today with a little bit more of detail, and you will see what are the changes that are happening there. We also talk about all those topics. I won't try to, to repeat or to read for you all the, the changes that are there. Some of those topics are new, like for example, the, the instruction in the official uh, minority language or the main reason for working mostly part-time. Some of them are retaking from previous census uh, uh, versions, like the Canadian military experience. The last time that was asked was in 1971 before 2021. And the reason why it was retaken is because all partners from the Ministry of Defense uh, uh, thought that it was relevant. It was better to put that information in the census. And then that's the consensus that we have to create a census that is relevant, that is important, that is uh, 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 functional for all sectors of society in Canada. So you can see we're always fighting in between keeping it in the same way to make it comparable and change it in a way that is relevant with the information that we are capturing for the society because the census wants to have to be a reflection of society and society is not a static society is moving is changing is evolving so the census also has to be with that fashion but at the same time we have to be very rigorous in terms of methodology because we want to keep the comparability issues with the census so let's talk about the methodology so we will be talking about the most basic aspects of the methodology and hopefully hopefully that will make it a little bit easier for you to understand why do the census is done the way that it is, the way that it's done, and what implications may have when you use the data. So uh, you want more information about that? We will be talking about later on how to access some of the uh, general information, the manuals for the, for the uh, census, and hopefully that will help you to understand better in case that you need more detail regarding methodology of the census. So the most important part of the census, or the most important part in, in, in presenting the census, or any information in Statistics Canada in general, will be confidentiality. Confidentiality is a big panoramic issue in Statistics Canada, not only for the census, for any information that we are uh, managing, that we are producing, that <clears throat> we are collecting. Why is that? Because we rely on the respondent to have the information, to collect the information that we have. If we start producing or, or we start having some issues with the confidentiality, guess what? The respondent, we lost the trust in us, and then chances are that the, the next time that we want to go to the respondent for that information that we need for that data that we are requesting from them won't be able to give it to us because they don't trust us. So that's the reason why we are making a lot of emphasis in confidentiality. And one of the reasons, one of the issues that I want to make a, a lot of emphasis here is that we collect a lot of information regarding the names, the addresses, the phone numbers that are uh, related to the respondents. The census is not exception, but that data is not keep it in the same database with the data information from the survey. 
So we basically use this information to verify that the respondent is really the uh, uh, person or the group of people that has to be respondent and really it belongs to, to the uh, uh, place that they, they are uh, 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 reporting that they are there. But once that we are sure their survey is complete, their data correspond to um, the responses are, are, are logic uh, according to the parameters that we have set in, then that information is kept separately because uh, we don't want to uh, 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 take the risk that some of the information could be uh, 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 identified with a specific respondent. Okay? When you think about the census, think about the census as a big puzzle with a very, very nice picture of the Canadian society. And each one of the, of the pieces of that puzzle per se is not the objective of the census. It's very, very important because without all the pieces, we don't have the full a picture, but still what we want to have is a view of the whole picture. And one of the other important things about the census is that responding the census is mandatory. The law is supporting the effort of Statistics Canada to uh, realize the, the census, to, to take, uh, uh, to make the census workable, and then it will be mandatory for all Canadian citizens to uh, respond the census. So how we collect the information? Well, uh, usually to collect information, there are uh, two methods, the US, uh, uh, census, they use the uh, usual place of residence and the factor method that comes the population at the address that they are found. And it's a combination of both, but we reported in the the JUR method. All the information that is uh, disseminated by the census use the the JUR methodology. So basically, we are reporting the usual place of residence. We collect all the information that is in the census that is disseminated in the census. We collect it from the respondent, except for the income data. For the income data, we have access to some administrative data from CRA and some of the immigration variables. We have access also to some uh, administrative data from the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada databases. And the main issue that we are doing this is first to uh, remove a little bit of the border, that is the, the, the census, especially the long form, could be sometimes a little bit overwhelming because it's about 70, between 70 and 80 uh, uh, questions that you have to answer. And we, the more precise the information it is, the more valuable will be. So if we take it directly from the administrative files, it will be a little bit easier on the respondent and it will be increased dramatically the quality of the data that we are collecting. So not all the dates on the census are the same. We have what we call three different uh, uh, key days that, uh, that we have to consider when we are talking about the census. The first one is ref uh, with reference or regarding the geographies. So the, the what we call the geography reference date is always uh, or most of the time January 1st of the year of the census. Why is that? Because the geographies in Canada in many, many places are very, very dynamic. They are constantly changing. They are constantly evolving, but we cannot make the updates at the last minute. So we have to make a cut period. Usually that cut period, as I mentioned, is the first day of the year of the census and all the administrative and statistical uh, geography that we will be talking later on in the second session are then considered based on what we have on January 1st of the year of the census. Okay, then the reference date, so that means the day that we have to report, the day that we are collecting the data in an in a, in a official manner, it will be, was May 11. So we want to have our report, we want to have a, a record of what was the situation 
with all the Canadian citizens in all the Canadian households in all the dwellings in Canada by the date of May 11 of 2021. And we collect all that information in a period that went from May 3 to September 24. But even though when we are collecting the information after May 11, we still refer it to the in my 11 reference date. So we keep collecting and then when we were collecting, we were saying, OK, so on my 11, were you living in this place? How many people were we living, et cetera, et cetera. So the report date, the reference date, the collection date will be my 11, 2021. So all the data that you uh, uh, see on the on the on our website regarding the the census is data that is referring or happens or was true or what referring to May 11, 2021. Who is the target population in the census? Our goal is, of course, to count all the people that lives or uh, has a, a residence, official residence and legal residence in Canada, but still we have to distinguish. So basically all Canadian citizens, Canadians living abroad that included landed immigrants, refugee claimants and, and their families and permit holders. Those are the people that has a legal residence in Canada or considered to have a legal residence in Canada. And those are the members of the target population. Those are the ones that we are counting to be part of Canada. There's other people that still has uh, or be legally uh, living here in our country, but still they are not part of the census. They are not part of what we call the target population. That is the government representing other uh, or another countries, residents for another country that are visiting Canada. Like there may be, you can think of people doing business or tourists that were uh, 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 being in Canada on May 11, or the members of the armed force from another country that are staying here in Canada doesn't count as part of the census. So those individuals are considered not to be part of the census. So how the data census is used at this moment, I invite you to be wild in terms of your imagination, in terms of your possibilities, OK? Uh, the census has more than 300 different variables, and some of the variables counts for so many categories that you can see we will be talking about later on on the census profile. Census profile has more than 2,300 lines, so that means 23 different kinds of information of data that is available in any any way. And as you can see here in this slide, basically the census gives us a huge scope of information for almost any aspect of Canadian society that has to be with their economic, with their financial, with their uh, social, with their ethnocultural diversity that is related to the Canadian society. So. The next set of the, of the slides in this part of the presentation basically is a mosaic of the possibilities. The census is widely used not only for the government, but also for the private sector. Why? Because the richness in their possibilities, socioeconomic, demographic conditions that are very characteristics, very characteristic of the Canadian society that's the best way to evaluate it and very accurate way to make the right uh, assumptions about the state of the Canadian society. Also, uh, uh, the census is always in the media because that will give us a better understand of what is happening in our urban centers, in our rural centers, in any other situation that is there is also a key issue that works or that informs or keeps us in a very 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 good idea of what is happening with the economy or how the economy has some effect in some of the social issues that are uh, 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 happening in our society like could be education that could be demand or potential demand for health services, that could be the use of transportation, that could be the use of other facilities in our cities, in our uh, communities, in our 
uh, rural areas because that way we have a better perspective, a better idea that has to be or has to done with our society. And as I mentioned before, it's not only the government, it's not only the big agencies, it's not only the uh, uh, big private sector that is using uh, uh, census data. It's basically any Canadian citizen that wants to understand better what is happening around them, what is happening in their community. One of the main starting points, one of the more recommended starting points could be the use of information in the census to have a perspective regarding the community that they are involved in. At this moment, I would like to invite Matthews to uh, participate in the next slide because he was kind enough to share with us some examples of how not-profit organizations can use the census. So I will be in charge of moving the slides, if you don't mind, um, Matthew, and then you will be helping me with this part of the presentation. And of course, don't make it very good because otherwise when I return to the presentation, people will leave, okay? So be be okay. a little bit solidarity, in solidarity with me. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> I'll try my worst. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for, for the next one, I just wanted to give a, a few examples of, of how non-for-profits in cities um, have been using uh, this data. Um, these patterns I've seen in non-for-profits as well as municipalities and other scales. Um, so, for example, the city of Calgary often uh, has their census series where they, they talk about how the population, what, what the breakdowns in the population are. Um, so what type of demographics, what types of languages, and they split this by, by smaller areas as well. Um, the way they use this then is for city planning. Uh, so decisions, do we need certain services in this one area or not? Um, so cities do this, uh, non-for-profits, I've seen them do this as well. Uh, when they're thinking about their services, they can look at what are those breakdowns? How should we serve those individuals? What types of clients are in the neighborhoods we're actually serving? And you can do that. We'll see this as we talk about geographies. Another good example that I just heard of, I'm talking to, to actually the some of those higher ups in the, the city of Toronto working with the homeless shelters is they've actually looked at this data, uh, the census data, so they get a sense of what the population is. And then they've compared that with, with the demographics that the organizations are taking themselves. Um, so then when you have those two, so, so say you're looking for um, uh, gender gender based uh, or, or, or other immigrant uh, groups, um, when they were looking at that, they could actually say there's an overrepresentation in, in the shelters there. Um, and that basically became an argument to, to provide more funding that they could send to their counselor's desk. So basically that meant um, because those those non for profits, which was 75 percent of the, the organizations uh, that were serving them uh, had that data, they were actually able to get that funding to support those populations to make sure their clients got that funding. And, and the counselors couldn't say no because the data was just screaming at them. They had to say, oh, we got to do something. Uh, the second example, if you could change the slide for me, uh, Francisco, um, is actually some work that that I was working on as well uh, with with United Way Calgary Region. So a few of you folks might might know about uh, this one from there. Um, we were actually working with some other data sources um, to to look at basically. Um, what types of sites around the city might be nice places uh, for a site selection for their new program for, for Planet Youth. Um, so basically, um, what we were looking for is a, a balance between in need and readiness. Um, so we, we looked at some of those need factors by looking at the census. So uh, looking at the demographics, looking at the income, uh, looking all that to see if the different neighborhoods would have more need in terms of, of getting supports for the, this, this intervention that would support uh, at-risk youth. Um, and we also looked at things around the city data, health data as well to sort of supplement that in, in sort of other open source things. So we got a sense of what, what areas needed it, and then we compared that to, to what sources were in the neighborhood, um, what sort of other groups and resources were there in terms of readiness. And we said, oh, here's the regions that had those highest scores. So if you look at this map here, basically the darker regions were the ones that had those highest scores that really matched them that, that need and readiness. Uh, and we could say these are the recommended neighborhoods uh, for those services. Um, this is actually inspired by York Region in Ontario, and they did a similar thing where they were like, we need to build a new place. 
Uh, there's lots of places we could rent at. So let's look at these neighborhoods and, and see which one is actually going to match the clients we want to serve in terms of our services. So uh, lots of different ways you can use it. This one is a little bit more advanced at the end, but I, I just wanted to inspire you to say you can do these other things. And the census might not be your only data, but but census data can also be one of those simple sources that helps you for things like funding to move you forward. So thank you, Francisco. No, thank you very much, Matt. Um... Your voice is way better than my best, so I feel a shame a little bit, but hey, c'est la vie. No, but I, I really appreciate your, your example. It was very good, Matt, and I want to make emphasis on what we already have said in terms of the census could be the benchmark. Is the, the survey by definition or the survey that we want to keep in, in, uh, in perspective or in view all the time because it's the one that is more comprehensive? And the second thing is that not all the answers may be in the census, but the census is always a good starting point and a good point of comparison because of the characteristic that we already have mentioned that is, is the benchmark, is the most comprehensive, is the most extensive. So it's, it's a way that I really like the way that Matthew put it in, in terms that is the way that you can use that information to make it more precise, more extensive and easier sometimes to understand. So the next set of slides will be some comparisons and some descriptions at the same time of what is happening in Alberta in general, and then how those are related to the census metropolitan area of Edmonton and Calgary. So we will be talking about those geographies later on today, but hopefully you just follow me with the presentation <clears throat> and that will help you to understand and to see, figure it out will open a little bit of your imagination in terms of what else can be there for you with the census. So the most traditional issue with the census is that we'll count the population. So in this way, for example, just by putting the general counts of the population, you will have a better idea what is the demographic situation of Alberta. Totally population of Alberta, total population of the two census metropolitan areas and then bingo. You can figure it out basically two tiers of the population in Alberta are standing, are settled in the two main urban areas of Alberta. Okay, And then you can see on the top the map of the census metropolitan area of, of Edmonton and in the bottom the, top, the a map of the census metropolitan area of Calgary that includes a very large urban core in both cases and then some rural areas that are uh, uh, together or in very close <coughs> geographic proximity to the, the urban cores that we are talking here. And then we can go a little bit more further in detail with the census. We can even talk about the ages and then you can see, wow, okay, so how is the Alberta population in terms of the age of of uh, of the population is a young population. What is what is uh, uh, available uh, that, that is living in Alberta, and then we can put it with some age categories, and then you can see the one that is more prevalent is the one that is 35 to 39 years old, and if you add it up all the categories that are in the working uh, uh, stage that are from 15, uh, 15 years old up to uh, 64. The total of them counts for a little bit more than 66 percent. So you can say that basically two thirds of the Alberta population are in the uh, working age or very, uh, uh, very uh, encompass the, the working age of, of the most of the population. And then when you compare those data again in between census metropolitan areas, or in this case, when you compare the median age between Alberta and the census metropolitan areas, you will see that the census metropolitan areas has a lower median age than the whole province. So what is that telling you? Okay, so you began to see here that when you began to put a little bit more detail in very, very simple statistics, in very easy issues to measure, to understand, to communicate, then more meaning 
and make it more comprehensive, make it easier to understand, make it more informative, more interesting for your audience, for your case, for your description, for your report, you name it. It becomes something that stop being numbers to become some information that is supported by factual figures, by the statistics that are behind the numbers. So in this case, we move a little bit more in detail and we talk about the proportion of couples, families and single families. And you can see both metropolitan areas more or less behave similar. However, in Calgary, the number of single families is lower than in Edmonton. In Calgary, it's about one in seven families. In Edmonton, it's about one in uh, eight families. So you can see that it's getting lower. And then you can even go a little bit more in detail in terms that uh, you began to count the family composition in terms of the presence of children and you compare married couples with common law couples. Some data that is available uh, from the from the census and that could make a lot of uh, difference in the way that you made the interpretation. So what is the issue here? Is because couple are married that they decide to have children or is it because that they have children that they got married? We cannot answer those questions with only this data. But the fact that we can put those possibilities with a clearer perspective, I think is very, very valuable for the issues that we want to cover. Uh, the same when we are talking about single parent families, the characteristics, families that are heated by a woman are more common in both metropolitan areas than families that are single parent families that are heated by a man. And when we are talking about languages, OK, now we know that here in Canada, we depend for a healthy uh, growth of the demographics or, or population. We depend a lot into uh, uh, immigration. So languages is some issue that could be very important, very relevant in the way that we are offering certain services or that we need to approach some of the populations, but how they are, not only what language they are speaking, but how they use that language that they are speaking that is beyond the official language of English and French. And then you can see that even though there are some language in common for both census metropolitan areas, still you have to count for the difference that make it necessarily a better approach or a better way to offer some services, depending if you are in Edmonton or Calgary, according to the language that they are using. And of course, that language will be, for in this case, we are talking about the language more often spoken at home or regularly spoken at home. What are the difference of that? I won't talk about that right now, but we will touch about the those information later on uh, uh, today, hopefully. And we can also talk about income. Income is an issue that is very, very, very important whenever we want to uh, uh, evaluate or to make a diagnosis of the financial situation of individuals, the community, the families, the households, the, the, the cities, etc., the society. So you can see that in the census also you can have access to that kind of information that will help to understand better how they are behaving. And then again, you will begin to see why are those differences and how those differences make a difference in the way that certain families or certain groups of the, of the society behave different from and others. In similar manner, we also estimate the prevalence of low income based on the low income measure after tax. And then you can see these statistics are very powerful. In my opinion, very sad because they, as you can see, when you put a, a little bit of attention in the distribution by age, you can see that the most vulnerable uh, part of the population that is affected for those low income measures are children, minors, or people uh, are younger than 17 years old. 
this is in general the, the proportion, but you can see when you compare those numbers with the children, they are higher, even with the other sector of the population that are more vulnerable, that are senior citizens, still they are higher. So that can tell you a lot about the necessities, about the way to proceed, about the possibilities with your society. So the last slides for this part of the presentation basically are guidelines. So you can see these are linkages to some of the products and the information that is available from the census. Uh, you will have it in the, in the copy of your presentation, so don't feel afraid. You don't have to memorize or keep in mind all those things. We will be trying to cover in that uh, in the next sessions. So the next topic that we will want to talk today will be geography and confidentiality. We'll be talking about confidentiality with a little bit more of detail, not only as a methodological uh, process when we're collecting the information, but now in the perspective of the methodological process that we follow when we are disseminating the information. We will be talking about geographies because as you may know, any situation exists in a given place at a given moment. So the moment we already know, was May 11, 2021. So now we want to make a little bit more precise in where those situations were happening at that moment. And then in the last part of the presentation, we will be talking about concepts and variables in a little bit more detail. And for the next session on June 5, we will talk about uh, data products and analysis, how to access, we will be basically a hands-on, how to be uh, uh, proactive in the way that you collect, the, you access the information. Um, we will be talking about some of your ideas that you passed through, through Matt about the necessities and about some possibilities with the data. And finally, hopefully you will have the opportunity to practice with a very simple situation how to try to make sense of the information from the census. So this is again for your own information. We will be hopefully doing the activity at the end of the presentation. So before we jump to the uh, confidentiality and geography session of the present uh, section of this session, section of this session, I like that. Uh, any questions, any comments? Remember, I don't have access to, to the to the chat at this moment, so I'm totally blind, but the good news is that Darren is with you and he's extremely good in uh, answering the questions that you may have. But I will be invite you, I will stop sharing my screen at this moment, and I will be inviting you to participate, to have some questions or some comments that, uh, that you may, may feel uh, it are important for, for at this moment. So please, the floor is open. Feel free. And if, if you don't want to, to type your, your questions, you're welcome to type it. As I told you, Darren is very efficient, very good. Uh, uh, Desiree also is, is those two guys are experts regarding the census, so don't feel shy. But there's sometimes that sometimes you think, oh no, I won't ask, I won't ask that because maybe I'm the only one that that I have the that question. But guess what? Then later on, it happens that uh, uh, when you ask somebody else, also have, oh, you know what? It's so funny because I have exactly the same question, something like that. So, uh, Rispa, please. So my question is, yeah, my question is, how do you layer information? Let's say I want to know. Uh, a specific group, maybe women, immigrant women entrepreneurs here in Edmonton. How do I, or in a specific sector, let's say childcare sector, how do I layer those three areas of information so that I can, I don't know, That's I think that's my challenge. It's, just, it's one no. thing to just go to census and, but when you have like, you know, census and then, I don't know. Okay, so you say childcare women entrepreneurs, Yes. In Edmonton. Yes. Okay. So I won't answer that, that uh, question right away, uh, but I love that question because that's exactly the kind of issues that we want to, to, to address. 
Um, I will leave that for the next session on June 5. I will try to guide you and we will start it. I really appreciate it. We, I, I have received, uh, I can, can I show that, Matt, the, 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 the information sheet that you sent me before? Um, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, yeah. yeah, so okay. we, we have all the, we have all yeah. the, he, he was There's kind no of names on it, so. Yeah, <laughs> to, to, to show me, uh, to send me some of the information, and I'm using that. Precisely remember the, the, the agenda says for the second session, the first part will be using your examples, using your needs, and we will try to guide you for the ones that are either more representative or more typical, or that have some characteristics that will help us for all of you to understand better and to try to make use of the data. I, I think your your uh, your questions is very very uh, legitimate. It's very very common in terms that oh, okay, so the census is marvelous. Seems to be that this is the panacea for many many issues. But how we can access that information? That's the key issue. So, but first, I mean, if I told you, oh, okay, the information is here, then the next time that you need similar information, you have to ask me again. Remember, I, I started mentioning that at the beginning that this is not the, the, the typical situation in that I will sh show you how to fish. This is beyond that. I don't want to show you how to fish because I know that many of you know to fish better than me. But I want to let you know that you don't even need to know how to fish. You just have to be brave enough to put your hands in the water to take the fish that you need because the data is so extensive, OK? And we will be talking about, uh, in the in the first session the next day, we will be talking about census profiles and census tabulations, and you will see the differences. And then hopefully, I will show you at least some information regarding this issue. I already took note about that, OK? Thank you, Ripa. And I, I just wanted to, to make a plug for Francisco, but um, when there, there's chances for questions, please, please do speak out. Um, this is a great opportunity. You have really, really strong people on this call uh, with Francisco, Darren, um, Desiree, and they, they know the data. So even if it's not census related, they, they know where it's at. And if you've been watching the chat, they're actually telling people where it is. Um, so even if it's not related, um, they'll help you get it. So. Um, even if you don't have a question right now, please, please do feel free to ask any of these sessions and it, it can be a gateway to get to some of those things that that you might not have known about before. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And, and as I told you before, uh, my goal, you will see uh, or, or a strategy for the for the last part of the presentation today is just to go directly to our website and begin to guide you about those things. And you will feel you will see uh, one of the big or the nice and the bad issues regarding our website is that you can access the information for mo in more than one way. So sometimes it's good because then you know that you can use different strategies and sometimes it's bad because it's confusing, especially if you are not familiar. And as I told you, the big, big issue is that we have more than three and a half million pages in our website. So if you're not familiar, that could be very overwhelming. It was for me like, for example, I spent the first three or four months working in the States Canada. I was like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm not learning anything. I'm not advancing at anything. But it's not like that. As I told you, the rate of failure that is regularly calculated from any activity in, uh, the humans are involved with is about 20%. And that 20% will happen most of the time, the first time that we are starting a new activity. Think about a baby that is learning to speak or to walk or to uh, uh, play with a new toy, et cetera, et cetera. They made the mistakes at the beginning, but then later on they become experts. So the same in a, as an analogy, you can use the same uh, uh, a proximity here with these issues. So if you don't mind, then I would like to start the second uh, uh, part of the presentation. And I will start again sharing my screen. So this time we'll go. Can you see my screen? So this time we'll go about confidentiality and geography. And the reason why we don't put all the slides together was with the purpose first to make a small break and second to encourage you to participate, okay? So remember, this is your presentation. Feel free 
Uh, some questions, some suggestions. I like. I really like this one that came in, in, during the break. So less than. If you don't have any comments, or you are very happy with the responses, of course you should be with the responses in the chat. Uh, let them continue because, as usual, we are a little bit behind, but nothing to worry. You will see. Geography and confidentiality are, in my opinion, one of the most important topics. Let's start with confidentiality. This is the agenda that we have. Uh, at the end of the of this part of the of the presentation, hopefully we will have a tour in our website, and then you will see why geographies are very important. So one of the issues that arise when we are talking about uh, the census is confidentiality, and we collect all the information that you can imagine, or all the information that uh, accounts in or uh, questionnaire for the census, but then some of that information is not available. That creates a lot of frustration and a lot of anger in many data users. But the reason why this is not happening is because we are very strict in apply the suppression rules that are in place, first to protect the quality of the data and second, the confidentiality of the respondent. So even though we may have very good data, very trustful, very accurate data for very small geographies of very, very small populations. Still, that information is not available due to reasons of suppression because of confidentiality and data quality issues. Those are the criteria when we are talking about uh, uh, data uh, dissemination, okay? So the minimum for the population has to be 40. And for other geographies like the postal codes, the postal codes are not Statistics Canada geographies. So for them, the criteria is 100 people. OK, and when the data becomes data related to uh, financial, economic, income data, then the threshold get a dramatic increase to 250 respondents or 40 households as minimum. And both conditions has to be met. Like if there is more than 250 respondents, but less than 40 households is not released or vice versa. If there is more than 40 households, but less than 250 respondents is still is not responded. The same criteria or similar criteria applies for the place of work because all those uh, uh, information of those data has a higher standard of confidentiality. And remember, we need to keep the confidentiality for all our respondents. So another procedures that, uh, that take place in our uh, protection of, of uh, uh, confidentiality is regarding the rounding, okay? So for this uh, short form census, the census that covers just the basic questions regarding population, dwellings, and language, then the criteria is rounding all the values except the totals for either zero or five, whatever value is probabilistically higher to appear. For the long form census is more or less the same criteria. However, there is this small consideration when the values are uh, less than 10, then it will be rounded to zero or 10. The five value doesn't be on place for that. So these are two of the main uh, uh, considerations that you have to consider or you have to keep in mind when uh, using data that has been disseminated because a lot of times people complain that, oh, you know, guys, no wonder why you work for the federal government because you don't even know how to uh, use a, 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 calcul a pocket calculator or, or, or a spreadsheet. I added up all the values in the tabulation and the totals are different from the totals that you are reporting. It's not that we don't know how to use the spreadsheet, it's just that there could be an effect in the random rounding that could be happening. The goal or the hope, or at least the mathematical hope, is that whatever we round up will be balance with whatever we round down, but not necessarily will be meet 
in every single occasion. So sometimes the total doesn't meet the, the summation of all the values that appear in the uh, in the tabulation, but now you know the reason is because is happening is due to a uh, uh, rounding effect. Okay, so geography, as I told you, is very very important in the census or in any survey, in any population, in any phenomena that you are describing or you are evaluating or you are trying to get information. You know that something happens at a given time in a given place. But geographies are very complex because different people, different uh, uh, organizations have different standards and different ways to account for similar or the same geography. So in Statistics Canada, we make a hierarchical range of the geographies. And that sounds and is very complicated if you are not familiar with it. But once that you are part of, you understand the system, it will help you to understand better the way that geographies are put. One of the issues that I want to share with you, because this is very important in my opinion to understand the geographies, we always have the tendency subconsciously to start it for the very large geographies and then keep going for the smaller geographies. In this case, is always easier to understand the hierarchies or the hierarchy in the geographies if you go the other way around. You're starting from the bottom, from the very small geographies, and then you build it up your geographies up to the top. And then you will see how the figures are there. When we're talking about geography, we will be talking about administrative and statistical geographic areas. It's a very simple concept. You will see why is that important. And keep in mind that for all the geographies, the reference day is January 1st, 2021. So maybe some of those geographies right now are different, but the way that we design and we collect the data and we disseminate the data will be as they were defined on that day. This is very, very important because otherwise you can do it. Uh, you can be doing some misinterpretation of some of the data if you don't consider this so here is the uh, hierarchy, the geographic hierarchy that we follow. And I will spend a little bit of time in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, graph because I think it's important for you to understand how it works. Consider this, see this as a diagram or as a map or as a photograph of a Lego set. I hope that most of you are familiar with the Lego sets and how simple they are when you are following all the steps. That's exactly the, the, the principle that is behind these kind of uh, uh, hierarchies. So you can see that the most or the simplest geography available is the block phase. And the reason why the block phase has a discontinuous polygon is because, excuse me, we don't have any information available to the public at this level. In fact, not even all the employees in Statistics Canada have access to this information. This is very unique for a very select group of people who are dealing in producing the data, in producing the dissemination table that we found, or custom tabulations that some clients order for us. And with those block phase, we create dissemination blocks. The numbers that appear in the bottom of all the geographies are the total number of those units at the national level. So that means that we have almost five and a half million uh, block faces, almost half a million of dissemination blocks, almost 60,000 or, or 58,000 uh, dissemination areas, a little bit more than 600 and 6,200 uh, uh, census tracts, et cetera, et cetera. You can see this is the clearest example. Okay, provinces and territories. We have 13, 10 provinces and three territories. The other thing to take account is that when we have a continuous line around the polygon, means that is an area that we have information. Okay, you can see for the postal code, we consider we know that is part of the forward rotation area, the first three letters of any postal code but still we don't have information for the postal codes. And it's very, very 
uh, paradoxical because you will see that your postal code, the information that you have with your postal code could be your best tool to uh, localize some information or define some of the geography that you are interested in. The next thing that you have to consider is that the blue areas is what we call administrative areas, areas that have been defined for certain legal or administrative procedures from other agencies or all other pieces of the government in Canada, wide, the wide polygons are what we call statistical areas, are areas that we define according to our necessities and according to our methodologies. And the last thing to keep in mind is the connectivity of the hierarchy. So that means that, for example, you can have dissemination blocks to form federal uh, uh, electoral districts and to have dissemination areas, and the dissemination areas can uh, be added up to form aggregate dissemination areas and to form census subdivisions and to form census tracts, but census tracts can be added to form census metropolitan areas and census agglomerations, but not census subdivisions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we will be talking about all those kind of odd names in the geographies, and hopefully you will understand better what is the methodology and why we are dividing here. My, on the, my guessing and my experience tell me that when people is working inside urban centers, usually this part of the geography, census subdivision, census tracts, uh, dissemination areas, and sometimes dissemination blocks, are the most useful geographies that you can find. Most of us understand what a provincial and territory is, what a federal electoral district is. Sometimes it's a very nice tool to have extra information regarding the borders, but in many cases, when you are dealing with a very specific population, it will be more useful to deal with those small geographies or with the census metropolitan and census agglomeration areas that we will be talking about. So if you are ready to continue, uh, I will tell you that this is the time to make a break, if you don't mind. Is that okay with you guys? Sounds good. Sounds good to everybody. So can we can get back a uh, quarter after? Or 10 after, what do you think? Is 10 after good for everyone? I will stop sharing by the mo for a moment, so that way we can uh, Okay, so Matt, then the decide will be 10 minutes after. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, thank you very much. I will be here in case that you have any comment or question. I will try to answer. I know that uh, Darren will be making a better job on that than me, but I would like to in solidarity be together to him. Okay, thank you guys. Francisco, if you want to go take a break, I can I can uh, stick around if people have questions. OK, I will just make a very brief break to replenish my water and then uh, I will come back in a couple of minutes. OK, thank you, Darren. Sounds good. No problem.
And just uh, looking at the chat, they keep you busy with a lot of questions, huh? Yeah, lots of questions, but nothing that I felt I had to uh, uh, interrupt you with. So, oh, okay. You are going to get into data tables, right? You're going to show them how you cross tabulate. Uh, I think that's that I, next session. Yeah, I think will be the second okay. session. So in this, basically, I will set all the, let's say, theoretical okay. <laughs> principles for that, and then in the second session we will go. Okay, so remember we talk about this, we talk about this, this blah blah blah. Okay, so, perfect. So that my goal today, though, my goal will be hopefully we can have a little bit of time to go for the uh, new suite and new search. Okay, that's okay. that's also my goal. Well, I'll let you know if any question comes up, I'll interrupt. But otherwise, it's, so far, it's been good. OK, thank you very much. No problem. <clears throat> okay, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, 
I don't know if you have any questions, any comments before we restarted the presentation, especially regarding the, the issues that we had already covered. Uh, while in the break, I was just um, checking the chat and I want to thank again Darren and, and Desiree. <laughs> uh, you guys are keeping them very busy. Uh, very interesting questions, very, very nice observations. Obviously, some of you have some experience using the data, so that's very good news for us. But please, if you have any other questions, any other comments, let us know. We will try to help you as much as we can. Sometimes we don't have the answer or, or we are not aware of any potential issue with the answer, so we can come back to you later by email or, or passing the, the response to Matt, and then hopefully he will uh, uh, send you that information. And we will try, as I mentioned before, best to figure it out if uh, uh, we are meeting your information in with that. So uh, if we don't have any other questions or comments and you don't mind, then I will start sharing my screen again to continue with the presentation. And hopefully this time will be a little bit more interactive or a little bit kind of uh, practical in terms that uh, my plan is at least to do a trip into our website and try to show you some of the possibilities with the data, with the with the geographies, okay? So one of the things that uh, th that that uh, we mentioned is how to be practical in terms of how we can find the geographies that we need. And, and most of the time, my recommendation at this moment is that if you are planning uh, to use the uh, census data in a regular uh, uh, way or, or you want to feel a little bit more comfortable using census data, always, always mark in your favorites the hierarchy uh, figure that we have in the previous slide. I will pass you the, the link in, in the next slides. Be patient with me, please. Or print it out and keep it visible uh, at your desk or things like that. Usually, our experience tell us that when you are dealing with big geographies, you don't have problems when you are uh, uh, localizing the information from that. The problem becomes a little bit more common when we are talking about small geographies from uh, sometimes even from small locations or from neighborhoods or wards or districts inside the urban areas is when some of these issues become a little bit more convoluted, a little bit more complicated. And we will be covering, we will try to cover all those possibilities because we are measure or we were mentioning the three and more common ways to uh, localize the area of your interest but for that we need to understand or, uh, or we need to put at your consideration all the concepts that are behind that after all we're statistics canada even though we deal in a lot of cases with geographies that are perfectly defined and are well known for most of the canadians if not all is still we need to transform those names or those locations into codes because code will be easier to, ma to, man to manage, it will be easier to identify, and it will be easier to put it down into the maps per se when we are using that visual aid. So you can see uh, in the administrative levels of geographies, the first one is Canada or the regions of Canada, then the province and territory, then the census divisions that are a uh, uh, geography between municipalities and provinces that are has certain uh, uh, legal and uh, 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 legal considerations regarding the way that they are defined by the provinces th themselves in consultation with Statistics Canada, and then the census subdivision that basically are the municipalities. But all of them contain a code. So like for example, the six regions of Canada are like this. Three of them are exact coincidences of the provinces, Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. The other are some grouping of provinces or the territories. And then each province and territory has their own code, okay? So the region one is the Atlantic, and then all the provinces in the Atlantic uh, uh, region start 
their code number with one. So the second one is Quebec, the third one Ontario, the fourth one the prairies, all the prairies provinces start the code with the number four. And again, this is something that is relatively simple, it's easier to in the management way, and you can get very familiar. So many of you will be needing to, rem to recognize the province 48 will be Alberta and the province uh, at 35 will be Ontario. Bingo, because those are the values that most of the time I will be sure. And why is that important? Because remember when we were talking about the hierarchies, we'll say that many of the other levels of geographies are nested or are uh, uh, encompassed or contained in larger geographies. So when we are putting the codes for those small geographies, then it will start with the cost for the provinces or the cost for the regions, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will have a better understanding why is this system working in that way. So for example, let's say we have a, a, a code or a, or a name for a, for a municipality that in this case is the city of Oshawa. So we started the provinces is Ontario, 35. The census division is census division 18, and then the census subdivision is 013 for Oshawa. So the code for the city of Oshawa is 35, 18, 13. This value has to be complete. If you only refer to the census subdivision 013, there are many census subdivision 013 in other census divisions in, in the same province or in different provinces. So this is not a complete identifier. You need to put the whole code and you see the continuity, the hierarchy that is going there. The province, the census division, the census division. Also, census divisions, there are several 18 census divisions in other provinces. If you just ask for some information about census division 18, it won't be clear what census division 18 you refer. You have to refer to the census division 18 in the province 35 or in the province 24 or in the province 46, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the values. This is very general. This is as a reference. You don't have to memorize, but you can see the values are nested in the province level for the federal electoral. The values are nested from the provinces for the census divisions. The uh, in the census division, the values are nested in the census division. So you can see that all those numbers will be aggregating into the code. And again, remember, because we are using the codes in some of the data that we release, it will make a little bit easier, it will make more sense to talk about the numbers, the codes instead of the names. And uh, I would like to make emphasis in this because we don't keep a uh, track of all the neighborhoods or all the districts or all the wards or all the uh, uh, areas inside some urban centers, we only have the code number. So you talk me about any given uh, neighborhood in any given city, chances are that you won't get information for that geography. So that's the reason why it's important that you have a good idea how the codes work, the coding for those geographies. And then we have what we call statistic geography and uh, geographic areas. Those are the geographies that many people may have a little bit of difficulties, but usually those are the geographies that are more adequate when you are, especially when you are looking for information at the suburban level, at the level of inside or intra-urban level, at the level that is below the census metropolitan area of the census agglomerations. We will touch about all those geographies very, very uh, fast with the most important details about those geographies, okay? So here we are. This is the link, by the way, to the to the to this diagram of the uh, geography uh, hierarchy. But if you want, we can also have access in our presentation later on, and you will see how will it work. So let's talk about first economic regions. Economic regions, are an area, a set of uh, a complete census divisions, except for one area in Ontario, that uh, has certain linkage in their economic life and then are grouping together 
for administrative purposes in an accord between the provincial uh, governments or territorial governments and Statistics Canada. And you can see in this map, the areas that are limited or their boundaries with purple are the economic regions and the areas in red are the census divisions. So you can see this is sub-provincial uh, uh, areas that could be important in terms of comparison. These regions are, you can see this very, very extensive. In the case of Calgary, for example, Calgary is their own census division and their own economic region because it has very, very strong economic output. The same happens with Edmonton. It's exactly the same census uh, division and the same economic region, but other uh, regions has several census divisions included in the economic region, okay? And you can see that's the map of the economic regions of Alberta. And then we talk about the economic region. This is as an example. You can see over here in the map, in the right side of the map, this kind of group of, of black lines basically denote the urban area of Edmonton, but the economic region of Edmonton is beyond that. And the reason why is that is because there are certain level of integration or co uh, 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 dependent dependability in between the urban core of Edmonton and the area that is covered by the census economic uh, uh, area of uh, economic region of Edmonton. Okay. The next level is census division. Census division is, as the definition uh, uh, is put it there is uh, uh, a group of several municipalities or census subdivisions that goes together. And basically the criteria is a very geographical criteria. It's a criteria of closeness. Whatever is there and has certain characteristics in common can be grouped as a census division. Remember, some sense, the, the adding of some census divisions will create an economic region. So you can see census divisions are geographies that are equal or smaller than an economic area. These two levels of geographies could be important for you. This is, for example, the economic, uh, uh, the census division for Edmonton. The uh, uh, borders are in red. This gray border is the economic region. Those continuous black lines are the census subdivisions or the municipality equivalent level of geographies. You can see here is the census division 11 for Edmonton. This is the number that corresponds. 85 is the census metropolitan area of Edmonton. But we will be talking about that a little bit later. And then you can see for the census divisions, then because they are nested in the, in the census division, sorry, for the census subdivisions, because they are nested in the census divisions, then the number is 11. That is the, the code for the census division plus the, the identify for the census subdivision. So the city of Edmonton, their code is 48, that is the province, 11, that is the census division, 061, that is the code for the city of Edmonton. Okay, but let's continue. Uh, the next geography that is began, or, or here is when things become can become more more relevant for you guys, is when we start talking about census metropolitan areas. Census metropolitan areas has a criteria of integration between some urban cores and the surroundings that are around that urban core. And that integration basically is based on the economic activities and the movement or the transportation of the commuting of the people living in the surrounded areas to the urban core that is there. The criteria for the definition of the census metropolitan area or CMA and the census uh, agglomeration or CAs are here. One of the things that you have to keep in mind, once that an urban center has become a census metropolitan area, it will keep that status forever. A census agglomeration can be removed if some of the minimum requirements 
are not meted in the future, either due for immigration or other economic factors that could have an impact on the activities or the size of the population that we are talking about. So this is, for example, the census metropolitan area borders of Edmonton. So, so far we have been talking about the economic region of Edmonton, the census metropolitan area of Edmonton, and then all of them has a different code, okay? So for example, all the uh, census metropolitan areas and census agglomeration of Alberta start their code with the number eight, and then they have an extra two digit identification uh, number, okay? So the next level will be census subdivision. Census subdivision basically are the municipalities or uh, municipalities or the equivalent to municipalities in the uh, geographies of Canada. For example, Indian reserves, Indian settlements, unorganized territories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the municipal status, of course, will be defined by the legal uh, definitions on the provinces or territories. And we just take advantage that they are defined like that. So now, Talking about Edmonton again, we have here the census subdivision of Edmonton, which code we already have seen is 11, 48, 11, 0, 61. Okay, so when we are talking about all those Edmontons, anybody has an idea, you feel free to chat, uh, to put it in the chat, which one is really Edmonton or what, which of those definitions economic region, census metropolitan area, or census division are the true Edmonton. And if you don't want to put your, your thoughts in, in or your response for that question in, in the chat, that's correct. Just keep it that in mind because later on, we will have a little bit of time to go to our website and you will see, hopefully you will uh, uh, confirm your response in terms of which is the true Edmonton or what is the best Edmonton that we can talk. So let's move to the next level of geography that could be very, very relevant for that. And I will make a lot of emphasis in these geographies because in my, in, in our experience, these are usually the geographies that are very practical of use for people who are working into the urban course or with people or services that are offered in the urban cost. The first one is the census tracts. Census tracts are relatively small and stable geographies that more or less has less than 7,500 uh, uh, people based and are part of a census metropolitan area and some census agglomerations. When we look again to the hierarchy uh, diagram, you will see that not all census agglomeration has uh, or has been divided in census tracts, and you will see how many of them are divided. But this is more or less the equivalent to certain neighborhoods or to certain sectors of the city that will meet better your geography definition of neighborhood. So this is an example in the downtown and university areas of Edmonton for the census tracts. And you can see the census tract, the code of the census tracts is this part plus the code of the census metropolitan area of uh, Edmonton that is 835. So all those codes, when you are looking for information about the census tract, you have to, for example, for this census tract 0020.00, you have to write in their search for that uh, uh, census tract, 835.0020.00. The decimal part has been added in order to keep certain uh, uh, order or, or, or certain uh, uh, logic in the way that we are keeping the numeration. Because, for example, we have here 00321 and 00322. So, we split it because now the population in the originally 0032 uh, uh, census tract has grown so fast that it's more practical. It makes more sense 
to split it, that census tract to keep more information, more detail, and make it more manageable. But if we add a new number that is not related to this one, to the original one, then we can have a very confusing way of numering all those census tracts. You can see that if you go with a little bit more of detail, the census tract go in this direction, and then return in this direction, and then return in this direction, and then goes back in this direction, et cetera, et cetera. So we try to follow certain logic that will make a little bit easier for the data user to identify and to get familiar with the information that is this that that is available. And again, this is when things become uh, relevant for people who are working inside the urban centers in a smaller geographies than the cities than the municipalities, because a lot of the information is still available for the census tract level, and some of them or some additions of the census tracts could become the neighborhoods of the areas or the districts that they are working the, with and are easy for them to identify. The next uh, level lower is dissemination area. Dissemination area is again a small, relatively stable, stable geography unit and try to get on average populations between 400 and 700 people. And this is the cells that are forming the census tract. This is the minimum cell that are forming the census tract. This is also the minimum cell that all census data are disseminated. This is very, very important because at the dissemination area, we can expect if they meet with the confidentiality criteria, see, that's what was, was important, why we have to deal with that before. If they are meet with the confidentiality criteria, all the information for all the variables collected and disseminated in the census can be published. So basically, this is the main unit for all data regarding the census. And this is an example. And again, because the dissemination area, again, they are nested inside the census subdivisions, then the number is like that. So 48, that's the code. 48 is the province. 11 is the census division. And then 1284 is the dissemination area. OK, so there could be many 12, 4, 1284 dissemination areas in some other places in the province in other uh, census divisions, but still per se doesn't mean anything. You have to add it to the province code and to the census division area to make sense of that. And this could correspond to a given neighborhood or a part of a neighborhood. But if you look for that information with that neighborhood name or with that district name, chances are that you won't find it. Why? because we don't keep track of all those names at that level, but we keep the code. So that's why it's important. I know that could be a little bit uh, 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 bothersome to, to deal with all those numbers, but that's the way that we can, can keep track in a more manageable and easier to distinguish way. And finally, we have the dissemination block. The dissemination block is the block informing the dissemination areas. At this level, the only data that is available is the total counts for the population and dwellings that are meeting their confidentiality threshold criteria. Okay, so dissemination blocks form dissemination areas and with that covers the whole territory of Canada will be basically using as the uh, a fundamental uh, uh, block or unit to create the codes, uh, to create the, the areas. And you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a dissemination block inside a dissemination area, the borders. So you can see in the bottom of the, of the screen, you can see the number of the, the code of the dissemination block. And you can see, you can hopefully by now you can identify the province 48, the census division 11, the uh, uh, dissemination area 2289, 
and then the dissemination block 004. Okay, and the borders in this map, those blue lines, correspond to the dissemination areas that are the numbers that are here in purple or, or dark red. Okay, so hopefully it will be clearer for you now how to localize some of that information. So again, let's come back. I think, by the way, my apologies, I think that in the copy that I sent to Matt, the next three or four slides are not included. I will send it those ones after the, the presentation, just for you to have it as a reference, because from here we, we are uh, on time, so we will make an, a small trip to our website. So I will try to find some geographies that we need. So the first, the first recommendation is use the hierarchy chart. Of course, you can use the hierarchy chart to all levels if you know the codes for any geography that is below census subdivision. But sometimes this is very, very difficult. Uh, you are more familiar usually with the names that are regarding to, to those uh, 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 numbers, to those areas. So it will be a little bit difficult, but the hierarchy chart at least will help you to the big geographies, the census uh, 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 metropolitan areas or the census agglomerations. Or oh, you can see, by the way, here I told you, uh, there are nine census agglomerations that are split or, uh, or are uh, divided by, by or, or are what we call tracked or has census tracts. And there are 102 of them that doesn't have census tracts. So the next level of geography for those ones that doesn't have the census tract will be the dissemination area, okay? And all the census metropolitan areas, the 41 census metropolitan area of the country are divided in census tracts, okay? Again, I will make emphasis, this diagram could help you to understand better the structure of the geography and to follow the uh, 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 logic that is behind finding the geographies that you need. So the next one will be using the standard geographic classification reference map. Usually the standard geographic classification maps refers to the economic regions, census uh, uh, divisions and census subdivisions. So up to the municipal level, this is always, always a good reference for the maps because then you began to link a name of the geography that you are interested with a code that will appear in the map, okay? So for example, if you are saying, oh, the economic region of Edmonton as such may not exist, but you can find information about economic region 4810, I think it's Edmonton, if I remember correctly. And finally, you can then use other tools that are more powerful and will help you to understand better or to localize the geography that you are looking for. The first one will be the census profile. We will be looking at that very, very briefly. The GeoSuite, that is a, a software that we have available, excuse me, is a, a page that we have available here in Statistics Canada and basically will connect the map of your geography with the code that you have and with some basic data. And then, in my opinion, the most powerful, the most useful will be the geo search, in which one you will connect your geography to a map, to a code, and to the data, to the information that is available for that level of geography or for that specific geography that you are looking for. So if you don't mind, I will stop sharing my screen right now, and I will try to make a trip to these uh, uh, four uh, 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 tools that we mentioned in the presentation. So I will stop sharing now and I will go again to my uh, here we are. OK, so I will start with the geographies okay and then if if we get still some time i will come back especially for example to this page are you seeing my 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 uh 
web page from the Statistics Canada right now? Anybody uh, can yes. let? Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you, Darren. OK, so the first one that I told you is the census profile. OK, in the census profile, you can localize geographies in a very, very simple way. This is very paradoxical because we don't produce geographies for the postal code. The postal code is not a geography that belongs to Statistics Canada, but that could be your best friend when you are looking for information at the geography level. So if you don't mind, I will look for some geographies for Alberta. OK, I think I have this one. I think this is the one that was working for me before. OK, so this is the postal code. And when I say look at it, bingo, it came with the list of geographies that contain that postal code. This is very, very, very important. None of those geographies will meet or will define perfectly the boundaries of that postal code. Make clear that that postal code, as, as, as it is, doesn't meet any boundaries or any limits or any geographic uh, uh, description from any uh, geography here in Statistics Canada, but they will be referred to any level of geography that will contain that geography. So the most general one will be the province of Alberta or the census subdivision of Edmonton or the census metropolitan area of Edmonton or the census division of Edmonton or the federal ele electoral district of Edmonton Center or the census tract or the dissemination area, or the population center, or the economic region, or the aggregation dissemination area. Bingo. See, now you have a range of possibilities that you can share. So, which one will be the best uh, as uh, match for this uh, 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 postal code? Well, it depends what you are looking for, but in this case, Let's be a little bit ambitious and let's go to the census tract. And at this moment, when you are in this, in this, uh, uh, looking for this information, I strongly recommend you to have the very old a uh, 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 tool of a piece of paper and a pen, and also write the codes for any other a small area that could be of your interest. Like, for example, in this case. I will copy the code for the dissemination area that is linked to this postal code 48 11 25 19 and for the aggregate dissemination area that is 48 11 0 2 1 1 and then you can see okay I will go for the census tract remember the code will be formed depending on where those geographies are nested in. So we can see here we will be talking about all those geography census division, census subdivision, uh, economic region, a population center, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But now we can go to the one that we are interested. We click here and then a census profile will appear. I won't be talking now about the census profile because we will be covering that in, in the next uh, session. But just to, to, to make you more interested in the presentation, you can see the wealth of information that is included in a census profile, okay? So I will leave it here because we are not still covering some of the variables, but then you can see if you click in that I index that is besides the number of the census track, then you can choose in between some parameters and one of the parameters that is here is the map and I really love that because I'm a visual person I'm a person that I can more or less distinguish what do I need when I have it in front of me so you can see you can increase the size of this map and then you can go closer and then you can say okay in the display options I will go by uh, displaying uh, labels bingo and then you can see that all those labels correspond to other census tracts that are neighborhooding to 
the census tract of your interest. If this covers the area that you are interested, bingo, you already did it, okay? So you have all the information that you need and is there. If not, then you can say, oh, okay, well, this is part or this is one of the areas that I will be interested. So I will return to the table and then in the table, I have the possibility to add a geography. So in this case, I could say, well, you know what? I know that the next census tract does, is, is beyond the, the borders that I will be interested. So I will enter then the code for the one of the uh, dissemination areas that are there and bingo. It will appear there. This is exactly what I enter. I will say, yes, please go there. And then in the profile now is also appearing the uh, uh, information for that other geography here. And again, if I click in the I index over there, the map will appear and then I will know exactly what is that. And then I will say, OK, so I know that the neighborhood or the area that I'm interested is go beyond this uh, uh, census tract, but not cover other census tracts that are neighboring. So maybe I will cover that area with some dissemination areas. I add the levels, I reduce the scale, and then I began to create my own geography by adding or removing some of the geographies that are going on here. And that's the beauty of using this tool, that you can go in that detail for your own convenience in terms of the possibilities that are around here. As you can see, it's a process that is not perfect, that could be very time demanding, but at least can produce exactly the geographies that you need and of course, you have to invest some time in doing so. OK, so now I will move to the GeoSuite. The GeoSuite is the other tool that we have available for uh, uh, localizing some uh, geographies. This works in a little bit different uh, uh, way. Anybody remembers the, the postal code that I was using? T5 J. 0 R2. Let me see. Oops. Sorry, I'm taking longer than it should be, but here it is. Okay. See, yeah, zero five two. Just let me write it because my memory never works when I need it. But pen and paper never, never fall. Okay, zero five two. And again, you select for the census that you wanted. In this case, there are four possibilities of the census. So this is an extra item that is not available in the census profile. Over here, you can go back to more census, but in this case, Let's keep it for 2021 and you can say, please look for it. And says it's not any match, but we can put them Edmonton. OK, and then. OK, so any oh, sorry. What did happen? Oh, my God. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I lost track of my. Oh, here it is. Sorry. So you can see all the names with Edmonton for different geographies, Federal Electoral District. Uh, uh, census subdivision, census consolidated subdivision, population center, a place name, uh, a census metropolitan area economic region will appear. So in this case, I will choose again the census metropolitan area. Here is the code 84 
48,835. Okay, bingo, here it is. And then I say, look for it, and bingo, it will appear with the most basic information about the census metropolitan area, the population, the total number of dwelling, the area, it will appear what geography is this, and it will be complemented by the hierarchy of the geography. So look at this. Over here, we lack any uh, uh, forward rotation area or postal code. So that's the reason why when I enter the postal code at the beginning, doesn't didn't get, didn't return me any result because it's not there. But then all the geographies that are not uh, uh, with the lines, then I could get more information about that. So I will just check in the map by clicking in this arrow. See, map results for Edmonton. I will check that is the area that I'm interested in. So this is the census metropolitan area of Edmonton. And if you remember, the shape of the area was exactly the same one that we were putting, that we were washing into the uh, uh, presentation when I was presenting. And this is the most uh, general information about the census metropolitan area of Edmonton. And you can see the description of all these variables. These variables continue on the right by going this way over here. You can see there are more variables and the descriptions are here, but I won't go in that way. I would prefer to go because we are focusing now in the geographies. I will say, well, I would like to see about the census divisions that uh, uh, form part of the census metropolitan area of Edmonton. Here they are. OK, so now the list, because we already have highlighted the list of the census uh, subdivisions, now you can see here and you can see right away the name of the uh, variables that are available is different now because this is a different geography. And also you can see that there are 34 different municipalities that form part of the census metropolitan area of uh, uh, Edmonton. And they will be listed according to their code, their uh, population, their uh, uh, dwelling counts, et cetera, et cetera. So you can uh, uh, rank it according to those values with those uh, uh, arrows. And also you can say, you can export this data to your own uh, 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 machine, to your own computer, okay? And you can select what, what columns should be uh, uh, taking place when you are doing those. So you can see that now here we have an extra step in terms that now we can select the year that we want the information and now we can establish certain relationship with other geographies that are linked to that original geography. And if you say, well, oh, okay, so now I know that uh, uh, is the census track, the, the census, uh, the census subdivision that I'm there. So I cannot access the census tract, but I can access still the dissemination area. So I will choose, uh, for example, what are the dissemination areas for Leduc County? And then I will highlight Leduc County, and then I will choose dissemination areas and bingo. There I have the dissemination areas for Leduc County. And the dissemination areas of Leduc County, because now this is a new geography label, has a different range of the uh, uh, variables available. And we can see that there are 22 different dissemination areas in Leduc County. OK, so finally, the last uh, tool that I want to check with you before it's too late will be the geo search. So the geo search is a more kind of uh, visual tool in terms that you can either use by postal code or place name like we have here and or you can go directly into the map so in this case i will seems to be that is is frozen my my screen here let's see if i will work so you can go by code or you can go 
manually by uh, uh, doing uh, uh, consecutive zooms into the map. The, the thing to notice here in, in, that, that is, in my opinion, important is the fact that when you are checking here, you will see that it's giving you also some information below the map. It says display boundaries are the provinces or territories. So these are the boundaries that define the provinces. So I will check here for Alberta and I will try to go to the city of Edmonton and I will try to identify the same census tract that we used before by uh, uh, zooming into the map. So you can see now the map has a very, very small scale. So now the boundaries has changed to the census subdivision. What does it mean? All the lines that appear in the borders will be representing the census subdivisions. Okay. Uh, so let's go and, as I told you, try to figure it out. So now the scale is going into the uh, dissemination area. Okay, so let's go for that. Oops, it's not working. Typical on this thing. Oh, I see, okay. So let me go for the for the postal code. Scenery five. J. Oh. oh, I put okay. I literally put O instead of zero. Here it is. Now that I've is here, I click it on this and then bingo take me to the different levels that will contain, not necessarily will match, but will contain that postal code. So could be the census division, could be the census metropolitan area, could be the census subdivision, the economic region, the federal region. Even here, you can add the health region that is a geography beyond the census, okay? And is related to that dissemination area, okay? And the step forward in this is that this is the real thing. Over here, you are creating a real link to the data that is available. So we have a data products that goes to that level of geography, that is the census, that the dissemination area, sorry, the dissemination area for this kind of information. So the information that will be available will be for 2021 regarding census program viewer, mother tongue, marital status, age, population, and dwelling counts, et cetera, et cetera. So then you can click here and bingo, you have a link directly to the data that is available at that geography level. You can also be playing with the map in terms that you can use, for example, I use the Hoover. Basically, the Hoover will be telling you that those, uh, uh, whenever you are pointing, will uh, uh, highlight the, the, the boundaries and will tell you the geographies that are available, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see those are tools that are available for you for free and hopefully will help you to understand better the issues that are regarding the data. Any questions, any comments? At this moment, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll try to come back to the presentation in uh, my in uh, PowerPoint, okay? Okay, so can you see my screen now with the presentation? Anybody? Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, again, uh, please don't feel intimidated for this, uh, the use of these tools. Uh, my, my recommendation is uh, try by yourself. Uh, that will be your homework. <laughs> because unfortunately, even though we would like to play continuously with that, if we do that, given the speed of the internet and the amount of information that they have to, to unload when we are using those tools, I will spend the whole the whole rest of the presentation and we still have some topics to cover that in my opinion are important. But if you began to play with them, uh, you will have the, the links, you will have the localization, and then you will find your best strategy to try to figure it out what is the best option when you are using these tools. Like for example, Darren and I has a very di different approach for that and not necessarily means that his or mine are better, it's just that or mine's uh, uh, works in a different way, and then according to the way that we make our reasoning, we try to approach in a different way the use of those tools, okay? So my recommendation is for that, if you get lost at the beginning, don't get desperate, try again. Remember, you will learn by, by, by try and error sometimes, and that's perfectly normal, and that's perfectly good. And if you feel really, 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 really bad, then Avoid it, and we will try to cover. Maybe we can have another session that we will be covering some of these issues. But you can see that once that you get familiar with them, it's relatively easy to be advancing for that issue. And again, I would like to make emphasis on that. Maybe some of the geographies that you are working that okay, with, that could be the neighborhoods or the districts or the wards or the areas inside the city. Uh, doesn't have any name in any hierarchy in Statistics Canada. So it's impossible to find any information for Gibridge or for uh, uh, Stacona in Edmonton or for any all those neighborhoods that exist there as such. But if you are able to meet or to match those neighborhoods with some of the borders or some of the limits in or geographies, bingo, you will have the information that you need just by using the code. And the key issue is that you understand what is the mechanics in the hierarchy, what are the codes, and how you can put it on your own service. Okay, so now we will be talking about some of the topics, some of the variables, some of the issues that we collect in the census. The amount of variables that we collect is humongous. We are not covering not even the 17 main subtopic or topics that uh, the, the uh, census are uh, administratively covered, but based on the suggestions from previous attendance and our experience, we will be covering only more or less in detail with some uh, uh, remarks uh, the, uh, sub the topics that we consider are more important that will be age, population, uh, sex and gender, uh, a little bit of uh, income, a little bit of housing, and the other one, oh my God, I don't remember, the other one I think is family and uh, ethnicity, ethnicity and uh, because it's related to the minorities, okay? So we will uh, cover the, the theoretical part of it, and for the next session we will be, I promise, a promise of a uh, Boy Scout, how is that? I promise, I promise that uh, we will have a lot of fun uh, going into our website uh, and trying to find some information there. So let's start with the concept of universes. Universes is nothing else but a sophisticated way to denominate the statistical units, the issues that we are counting in the census. So there are four types of uh, uh, universes the population or the people, the dwellings, the households, and the families, okay? So those are the main uh, uh, universes that we count in the census, and all of them are or could be interrelated for many, many ways, but there are some issues that can be counted only exclusively in the people, others only in the dwellings, other in the households, and other in the families, okay? If you ask me for the age of a family, it's impossible to define, but we can find uh, an age for a dwelling. 
or we can find an age for a person. Okay, so you will see why, even though there seems to be a lot of overlapping and for sure too much uh, relationship in between those universes, they are different. So hopefully the difference will be clear for you and then for you will be a little bit easier to understand and to follow in that way. Okay, so population universe is basically the individual, the people, the persons who uh, belong to our country. And here we have some sub-universe examples. So we call sub-universes when we identify a part of that universe that is very common or that is uh, a lot of times requested for the data user or for the clients in terms of that, okay, so we will be talking about uh, people in the labor force age 15 and over. Why? Because this is very, very common. Or people that is under uh, 15 years of age because it's important for demographic uh, 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 issues. Uh, people living in private hall, households. Uh, people age 65 years old and older because those are the citizen, the, the senior citizens or the people that is at least legal in position to retire, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that any item that can be put, any label that can be attached to an individual is susceptible to be a sub-universe in this universe. But keep in mind that you cannot go very, very, very fine. You try to keep the, the level of the universe comprehensive enough to be worth it, to be considered as such. Otherwise, if you, be, if you go very granular, you can be uh, losing the opportunity to really uh, attach some of those characteristics. And the variables that we measure for, for this uh, uh, universe or the individuals of this universe could be the age and sex, the gender in this case, the marital status. You can say that a, a family uh, has a mother tongue, for example. They could be different mother tongues for the, for the members of the family. However, there is usually one or two or maybe three mother tongues that could be attached for an individual. The indigenous identity or the ethnical origin, et cetera, et cetera. So all those variables are the characteristics that we are measuring in that universe. The dwelling universe, and here, when we are dealing with data, you know for sure, because it seems to me that you are very data savvy people, that you are very familiar with the use of data, you need to know that you have to be very precise. In many, many vernacular or very common language, dwelling and household are synonymous, are exactly the same. In the case of the census in Statistics Canada, the dwelling and the household are different items, okay? Dwelling is the set of living quarters, the physical structure that we are living. And basically we have two sub-universes there that are collective dwellings, the dwellings that uh, are uh, institutional, communal, or commercial in nature, and that they share some services, usually uh, uh, cooking facilities, uh, service facilities, and washroom facilities, and the private dwelling. The private dwelling is where the entrance of the dwelling is the one that can be used or can be reached without passing through the living quarters of some other person or group of person. Basically, the one that has an independent access and has their own source of energy, okay? So some of the variables that are there are the structural type, condominium status, period of construction that is related to the age of the, of the dwelling, uh, the condition of the dwelling, the number of rooms, number of bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So you can count that in the dwelling, in the living quarters, but not in any other universe. The next one that is, uh, a lot of people have sometimes difficulty differentiating is the household universe. And in this case, the households refers to the person or the group of persons that occupy the same dwelling, okay? So a household could be a, a person living alone, a group of unrelated persons, a, a family, or a group of two or more families sharing a dwelling, okay? Keep in mind that in the census, 
our main goal is to keep information or to keep the data for all the possibilities. And that's the reason why sometimes could be very, very convoluted because the vast majority of the cases, a household will be synonymous of a family, but not all the cases will fit in that same description. So that's the reason why we have to be very specific in regarding the definitions and the possibilities with that. So you can have here them uh, in the household uh, universe, some of the variables that we are collecting from them, that could be the size, the income, the suitability, and income, for example, is, an in, uh, is a variable that you can collect for the household, you can collect for the individual, you can collect for the family, okay? Uh, the, the type of, of household that it is, that could be one person or two or more persons, basically, the shelter cost to, to income ratio that is related to some uh, uh, measurements of the income and the level of uh, uh, income that they have. Uh, and then we have the family universe, okay? So the family universe basically is split in two sub-universes, census families and economic families, okay? So these two are very close related. I will try to explain you and try to give you the main characteristics of both of them. Census family is basically what we know as the traditional family, either a married couple, a common law couple, or one long parent that live with a child or some children. So the, the members of the family will be wherever are members of the a couple or the children that could be by beer, by marriage, by common law, or by adoption. And sometimes when there's one, this, what they say, one generation escape, when grandparents live with their grandchildren, also that one is considered a census family. So in many, many ways resembles the traditional a concept of a family, the, the, the census family, okay? So again, we add this uh, diagram because in my opinion, helps to understand better what, what we may mean when we are talking about census family. So you can see that if you read it, again, my, my, my uh, preference or my recommended options, read it from bottom to top, okay? So basically you have single, uh, simple step families or complex step families that are a step family, and then together with the two parents, no step family, with children or without children, there are couple families, or then together with one parent families form a census family. So it's up to you to go this pattern, uh, top to bottom or bottom to top, to try to understand the concept of census family. But you can see this more or less meet the definition or the understanding of the traditional family. Economic family is a concept that is uh, wider in, in, in scope that consider other possibilities. So for example, uh, these are the, the uh, uh, definitions or the uh, conditions for an economic family. And you can see that an economic family could be uh, more than one census family or when nieces and nephews living with aunts and uncles are in the same dwelling or uh, any other relationship. And the, the, usually the thing that will help you to understand the difference between economic and, uh, and uh, census family, all census families are economic families, but not all economic families are census families. So that means that economic families include all their combinations, all their occupations that are not accounted for in the census family. So again, we are this diagram, hopefully uh, trying to help you about the understanding of these issues. So you can see if you put it in, in that way, this part of the diagram, the lower left part of the diagram, basically is a simplified version of the census family uh, 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 definitions. And then you add, person not in census family living with other relatives, including foster children, and they form economic families, okay? So the key issue is that there are other relationships here 
forming a group and are economic families. And then we add to that persons not in economic families living alone or persons living with no relatives that forms persons in private households and together with persons in collective dwellings give us the total population. So you can see that this is the diagram to account for all the individuals there. So uh, you can see over there the uh, the possibilities with the variables that are related to the family universe are census families, status, structure, income, or economic families, status, structure, income. And this is for an example of a cross tabulation that accounts for data for the uh, census families in private households. And in this case, this, this uh, tabulation comes from data, comparative data from 2116 and 2011 from the total of the data. So let's move then to the variables. Variables are basically the characteristics that we measure in the population. There are different kinds of variables. Uh, the topic of the uh, variables in the census is, is very, very large, it's immense. If we go in a little bit of detail or just enumerating each one of them, we could spend several hours in going there. So we will just try to figure it out, as I mentioned before, the most relevant that we thought could be for you. In total, there are 382 variables from the census that are available in different tabulations. All of them could be the same variable, for example, age, with a different level of categorization. So, for example, the age uh, uh, variable has 34 different uh, uh, varieties or 34 different to categorize it and then make a different variable. And there are another 13 variables that are not necessarily age variables, but are related to the age variable. So the, the take a message home is that it's very, very rich, the, the universe of variables or the world of variables, and there are different kinds of variables. There are direct and the right variable. Direct variables are variables that we measure directly into the census, into a question, and we translate or we report that question as they uh, respond and give us that information. And there is all other that is the right. For example, we ask in the census for your birth date, and then from that we der derive your age. There are also called variables. For example, when we ask you for your occupation or the uh, main activity of your place of work. You make a description of those two things and then we translate those, that inform, those pieces of information into codes according to the nights and the notes that are available. There are some other variables that just accept a single response. For example, marital status. You cannot say that, oh, you know what? When I'm here in the lower mainland, I'm married, but as soon as I cross the the rock is going to the east, I become mainly single. No, that's not the case for any of these characteristics. You are married or you are divorced or you are single or you are separate or you are widow, but you cannot be in more than one category. And finally, there are other variables that accept multiple responses, okay? So those are variables that you can put more than one answer ethnic origin, mother tongue, et cetera, et cetera, uh, occupation, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because you may have more than one that meet the criteria that is requested in the question of the census. So let's, let's uh, talk about the main topics or the main variables that could be related to the issues that you deal in a regular basis in a very, very, very fast way. And keep in mind this, okay, this is just a very, very theoretical uh, uh, overview of most of them. In the next session on Monday 5th, we will have a better chance to go there in practice and see them in action in the uh, tabulations. How do you make uh, an interpretation of that, okay? Population and dwelling counts, as we mentioned already before, this is the most basic ones. It's very, very important in terms that will give you a very generic uh, 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 view of the geography or the society that you are uh, working with and help you to understand better 
what is happening in your population, okay? This is very also very, very important in terms that the Federal and Provincial Arrangement Act is uh, based on the census to determine the revenue transfer from the federal to the provincial governments. And these are some of the outstanding data from the last census. Age, sex, and beer, and gender also very, very important. Age and sex are by definition the two basic demographic characteristics of any population and are very, very helpful in terms that will tell you or will help you to understand what are the possibilities with any population in terms of working reproduction potential for development. In this case, the most important issue to take care of here is that we add the gender uh, a question. Okay, this is the first time in Canada and apparently in the whole world that a census covered the gender categorization. Still, there could be some historical comparisons if you just consider the sex question. Okay, the sex question is still the same that came from 2016 and before, but be very careful because there is not a way to know how transgender or not binary respondents that are some of the gender categorizations responded to the sex questions in previous censuses. So the graphic that will help us or hopefully will uh, uh, put some light in the way that we interpret those questions is that the universe or the uh, way, the, the, the total uh, number of people that is defined as men is men plus, that basically consists of the cisgender men, transgender men, plus a section of the non-binary persons, and the woman plus, that is the set of transgender women, cisgender women, plus some uh, uh, section of the non-binary uh, uh, persons, okay? So here are some examples of how we reported and how we use that that uh, uh, that information. So you can see, in terms of age, we are getting all the uh, uh, older uh, uh, cat, uh, age category is growing faster than the younger age category. They are already more proportion of old people than younger people, and sex at beer proportions become very close to 50-50, with a little bit higher for females and the number of non-binary uh, person is very low in proportion. And for that, you have to consider that there will be some issues in disclosing that information for small geographies. Uh, regarding families and household, this is another uh, a topic in the variable that are uh, very important or could have a lot of implications in the line of work that you have, okay? So basically, it, it, uh, it works with uh, the the kind of arrangement that people get together to, to be living. So the, the family uh, topic includes household type, marital status, family structure, and the living arrangements of individuals, okay? Be careful because these uh, uh, variables that are uh, uh, attached to the families and, and household are just good or are accounted for private households. Remember, we were talking about collective and private. In collective households are not counting for any variable that are included here. So this will be basically applicable for any family related characteristic and concepts. Uh, and those also in the live individuals or living in private households, okay? And one uh, uh, important consideration is uh, uh, to consider the type of households that takes account the family structure presented in the private households. So for example, multi-generational household means that there are more than parents and children living there. And this is an example of the data that we are reporting, okay? Opposite sex couples increase at this percentage and same sex couples increase in a way larger proportion. Of course, the number of opposite sex couples, as we see, for example, in, in the previous uh, part of the presentation with uh, Alberta, uh, uh, Edmonton and Calgary are way higher 
than any other. And of course, we'll talk about or are related the family with some household characteristics. OK, this is when sometimes the family and the household uh, uh, variables are the same because it's there is only one family living in the household, but sometimes may be different. Why? Because the household could have a different structure than just the traditional census family. The next variable is the uh, income. Income is always, always, always very, very important because give us a portrait, give us a chance to have an idea what is the financial, the economic situation in our community, in the individuals that we are studying, in the society that we are working with, or in the geography that we are interested. OK, so uh, economic information is always one of the uh, topics that are more demanded. The good news is that most of this income information came from administrative data directly from uh, uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Revenue Agency and covers 100% of the population that respond <clears throat> the census. OK, so we'll, for example, we can use the data alone or in conjunction Francisco? with. Egno yes. Pa yes, I sir. apologize. Apologize for interrupting, but I just wanted to give you a, a heads up on the time. We only have a few more minutes left. Oh, OK. Oh, five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Darren. Otherwise, I will keep talking for the rest of the afternoon. So you yeah. can see. Thank you, Darren. You can see here uh, the highlights regarding the data. And in this case, it's very, very important because a lot, a lot of people use it to uh, are related or in conjunction to ethnocultural, to immigration status, to level of education, to uh, labor characteristics, to geographies, et cetera, et cetera. And then they can have a more in-deep analysis regarding the wage, the self-employment, the income situation for many, many, many uh, other possibilities. And of course, that provide data for uh, analysis on the economic well-being, the co income distribution, the income inequalities, or the low income possibilities. Another uh, uh, possibility or another topic that is important and is related to, to the uh, individuals is the ethnic or cultural origin. Again, this is an issue that is related to uh, the uh, Minorities Act, and also it could be uh, linked to some economic and educational and immigration status that could be relevant regarding that. Notice that especially for cultural and ethnic origin, the data is Fluid. So that means that sometimes Indian, Punjabi, and South Asian ethnic or cultural origin could mean exactly the same. Okay, so be very careful in those considerations because, as we mentioned before, in working with data, precision means everything, but in this case, you have to be very, very careful. And again, this is one of the topics, some of the variables that will help you to understand better or to make a distinguish in between what is the situation of the <clears throat> traditional or citizen or the citizen that was born here in Canada against people who has a different ethnic or cultural origin or define themselves with different origin or immigrants that are coming to uh, uh, to Canada. And uh, this is also uh, very sorry, important. Sorry, Francisco. I'm, I'm going to interrupt because uh, we're we're right near the time, um, and I just want to make sure we can we can finish these slides next session. Um, but okay. I just wanted to make sure that you um, introduce the exercises, um, so people, if they have time, they can go in um, at the end of the slides. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say for all the participants, and um, first of all, thank you so much, Der um, Francisco, and and everyone from Statistics Canada for helping us out. Um, you've done a great job, and I really have been excited to hear more. Um, next session, we will finish up this activity. Um, but but also I will say the next session will be more of that applied session where we'll be talking more, doing things, all of that stuff. 
Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for you. So next session, you'll really get into how to do those things and get into those questions and those breakdowns that we went to. Um, but uh, Francisco, if you could just uh, introduce these activities, that would be great. So people have a chance to do them before the next session if they have some time. It really will help them for their learning. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I was just one slide away from finish, but yeah, you're right. It's better to do that. So this is a suggestion uh, 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 exercise that you can challenge yourself, okay? It's very generic. It's very general. Try to figure it out the options with the tools that we already manage. That in this case will be the census profile. We didn't go to the uh, variables in detail that are accounted in the in the uh, census profile, neither we go to the tabulations, but you can fill or you can use your uh, 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 exploring uh, uh, self, your, your wild side of, or your personality to try to figure it out. Some of the possibilities here, feel free to choose the geography that you wanted, okay? I don't want to tell you, please go to that census track or please go to this uh, uh, geography or to this uh, uh, precise census subdivision, et cetera, et cetera. Just try to define there's yourself that in advance, and then maybe you will find that uh, information uh, directly from or, or, or tabulations, or you have to make some aggregations from the uh, census profile. Okay, uh, the thing is that, uh, if I might suggest, at least in this first step, please try to, to follow at the census subdivision level because it's the, 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 the geography that is already well defined. And then arbitrarily choose a geography that is inside a census subdivision or a census metropolitan area that could be a census tract or a dissemination area. And try to make by yourself how this could work. And as uh, uh, Matt already mentioned, next uh, session, I will just start it with the last slide that I couldn't finish, I couldn't cover. And then from that, based on the information that you have given, given me or some information that you can send to, to, to Matt in the next couple of days, we can more or less create some examples for you to help you to explore or uh, database or tabulations and bingo from there. Hopefully you will feel uh, a very, very, robust and very wild to, to go for the big questions that you want to answer using your data. OK, so I will stop it here. Thank you very much. Sorry, my apologies that as usual, I get a little bit behind time, but I try to cover as least, I mean, as detailed as possible, all the topics that we are covering. And sometimes, as usual, I get behind. My apologies for that. Thank you, guys. See you on the fifth. I'm uh, assuming that whatever question you will be sending that to to Matt, and Matt will let me know. In, will let us know in the next couple of days, and from then, hopefully, I will create or I will try to answer most of the questions in the way that I made the interpretation of your questions. And you, hopefully, you will find it uh, more more uh, applicable. Awesome, thank you. Yes, please send them to me. You have my email and I'll make sure to pass those on to Francisco. Thank you yeah. so much for attending and we hope to see you in the next session. Um, Francisco, could you turn the video off so I can... Uh... Oops, sorry. Here it is.